Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of American Rambler. I'm your host, Colin Wilbur. Thank you for listening to the podcast. On today's show, I have historian Josh Rothman. He is the author of the new book, The Ledger and the Chain, How Domestic Slave Traders Shaped America. It is available through Basic Books. It has been out a little while now, about a month or so. I've been reading it and enjoying it, and I think... Josh does a great job of bridging the gap between, you know, people who like to read history as kind of a novel, as fiction, and the hardcore historians who do a lot of archival research. He's done both here, done a ton of research, and has also written a very engaging story that that focuses on several individuals engaged in the slave trade in Virginia, Mississippi and Louisiana. He really gives us a view of things on the ground and what it was like for the enslaved people being dragged across the country to be sold at markets in New Orleans and Natchez. And he also gives us, you know, a very rich biographical study of who these guys are and how they kind of fit into the larger social landscape. And despite what some people might think, these slave traders were not necessarily outcasts. Uh, there might have been a bit of the killing the messenger in terms of people who didn't like these guys getting their hands dirty in the slave trade. But if you were a Southerner who owned slaves, you you had a good chance of dealing with slave traders on a regular basis. So, you know, they were performing a function in the Old South and making a lot of money doing it. It's it's obviously a a very kind of dark and disturbing topic. Um Josh begins in the early 19th century when the slave trade is picking up in the South because the African slave trade was banned when Jefferson was president, but this only made the domestic slave trade more lucrative, and as the United States was expanding into the West, the southern states were you know, planting more cotton and building more plantations that needed slaves, so if you were a slave in Virginia, you might get sold down the river, as they said, to the sugar plantations or cotton plantations in Louisiana and beyond. And all those states that, you know, we now think of as the quote unquote Old South, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, even Texas, were, were pretty new states in the Jacksonian period. Um, you know, only about a generation between statehood and the Civil War. So these were new states that were uh, part of the westward expansion. And slavery was only growing, and just despite what some people said then and now, it was as profitable as any business has ever been profitable. Yes, some people couldn't make money, they might have gone bankrupt, but uh, other people were making a fortune. And so it is a very American story, a, a frontier story in a way of uh, seizing on uh, Western lands and, and trying to make your fortune out West. Because compared to, you know, the East Coast, uh, Mississippi was was the frontier for a long time. And you can kind of see that in Faulkner talking about people well into the uh, 19th century and into the 20th century. Josh has done a great job with, with this book, and I'm about halfway through, so I, I look forward to finishing that. And as I like to do on this show, I don't just like to talk shop, I like to talk about historians and where they came from, how they got their start, how they got interested in history. Josh uh, studied under Ed Ayers at UVA. Josh is a New Yorker originally, but he's been in the South for a long time. He is head of the Department of History at Alabama now, a great uh, department of history there. There's some people I, I think I need to get on the podcast after looking down the roster there. But, uh, you know, he, like everyone else, he had a rough year getting through COVID. Glad the Glad the semester is over and summer vacation is about to begin, and it seems like he's he's got a couple of projects going on, so he's still heavy into the research. So we don't just talk history; we also talk some football and the SEC and and how you know football doesn't really get much bigger than SEC football. He is you know on the Alabama side of things, and I went to LSU, and even though you know football wasn't really my thing. Obviously, college football in the South is, is as big as any sports can get. Though I'm not a huge football guy, uh, I do, I've always loved sports and, and I'm really enjoying the Red Sox. Being in first place and playing well, not so much last night against the Blue Jays, but they, they've been doing 
pretty well, and I'm just glad baseball is back, and also excited that Worcester got the Triple A affiliate of the Red Sox, and the stadium looks pretty cool right downtown, so I look forward to taking in a game when I am back home. So we cover a lot of ground here, as I like to do. I hope you enjoy this, my talk with Josh Rothman. So are you doing the, the podcasting rounds right now? I did a podcast yesterday. Uh, I'm trying to think of what the other thing was I did on Zencaster. Yeah, I guess that was also a podcast. Yeah, so I did one with the the New Books Network uh, okay. last week, and then I did the uh, the Age of Jackson one uh, yesterday. Yeah, I just saw that Dan posted something. Oh, did he post it? Okay. So, yeah he he's he's got a good thing going over there. I'm mean, just putting them up like once a week for. Yeah, he um uh he he stays very busy. Yeah, for for a guy who's ABD too, he's a lot more <laughs> <laughs> he's a lot more focused than I was as a grad student. Of course, we didn't really you have and, we you and podcasts. me both more yeah. focused and more and more entrepreneurial too. He's originally from Australia, but uh-huh. he's I think he's been here about seven years. He's already a citizen, so he's very he's very gung ho about America and. I'm I'm totally jaded at this point, but I'm glad that he. he <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> I've had him on my show, and you now he's he's a very personable guy, and oh yeah, he's very marketable right now. So I think he's going to do fine in this this horrendous job market. I hope um, so. I hope so. It sounded like from when I talked to him yesterday, like he would not. Um, I I don't think he's going to go on the market this coming year, but but he might sort of dip his toes in and see what happens. Yeah, I think he's not going to be done probably till the end of this year at the right. at the earliest. So right. uh, he's got a little bit of time, but yeah, yeah I mean, it sounds just... like it sounds like because with COVID, Stanford has thrown a sort of an extra year of funding at them. So I think he'll be he'll be all okay. Right. That's good. Yeah, I mean, I don't envy anyone on the market right now, and I'm on oh, my, God, I'm on no. myself, not for teaching jobs, but it's just as bad. Anything related to history, I mean, it's really. What are you trying Sad. to land? Something in the archive field, because I've been doing that since 2007, and I really like it, but man, it's it's not... It's not yeah, easy. no, it's a it's a total bloodbath out there. It's, um, <laughs> it's uh, yes. no, it is. I mean, there's, yeah, there's no, no point in sugarcoating it. No, uh, no, uh, it's... and it's it's really hard for us to kind of counsel graduate students and um, you know even admit graduate students. I, I think the only thing that 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 lets me be part of a department, actually chair of a department that does it with a, a something resembling a clean conscience, is that. I know that a lot of our students are coming in and they're getting terminal master's degrees um, and often going on to do something else rather than, you know, going all the way in for a PhD. Yeah, um, I think that's and even and even our PhD students, you know, they're they're most of them things are working out for them one way or another. They're landing, you know, they're landing jobs, but the they're but I think that's because the kind of jobs that our PhDs usually get tend to be sort of smaller and regional colleges who are. You know, they're not looking to sort of land a graduate student from Princeton. Um, that's sort of not really on their radar. They're looking for somebody who's kind of local, who's got a PhD from a school they recognize and can trust. And so, you know, if you're a, a, a kind of small college or community college in Alabama, you get somebody with an Alabama degree. That's that's actually kind of the person they want. Yeah, well, that's good. And I mean, it, just at this point, I think people, I, I hate to say, it, I mean, they'd just be happy with anything that pays the bills. I mean, yeah, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I hate that we're in that position as a profession, but I think that's, I think that's right. Um, at least for now, I, I, I hope that'll change, but um, I'm not, I'm not super optimistic about it. I think the, you know, the, 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 the path that 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 I was able to follow, you know, you go, you get your PhD, you go on the market, you get a tenure track job somewhere at a research school like that. I don't know. That's I I don't know that I'm the, that that I'm of the last generation that can get those jobs, but man, they're getting tougher and tougher and tougher. I w- I never really wanted to teach anyway, but I have taught a little bit, and I I check the boards now and then for teaching jobs just to see what's you know what what's on HNet and some mm-hmm. other places and. For my field, I mean, even anything just nineteenth century, like there's a handful of jobs a year, yeah, at good places, yeah. and the, and the competition is just it's oh, crazy. I mean, it. the things that, and, and I noticed this even before, uh, even before COVID, and and maybe even before two thousand eight, but 
you know, the, the, the CVs of the people who are coming to the table are just, I know every generation says this, but like, I would never get a job if I, you know, coming out with the, the CV that I had now. And I, you know, I had a couple articles and things like that, but there are people coming out with, you know, uh, digital projects and book contracts and, and, you know, tons of teaching experience. And it's all kinds of things that just weren't really even on the radar for, for, uh, for, for people like me who came out 20 years ago. Yeah. I think the expectations have just gotten so ridiculously high for everything and yeah. especially for academics. Yeah, no, I mean, I've had people on the podcast who have a book and they're still doing adjunct gigs and like mm -hmm. trying to string those together and make a living doing that. Um, and you know, I had to find my timing has been great. I had to find a job like during the 2008, 2010 fiasco. Mm. God, and the then worst. I'm on the market this year after COVID and all that austerity and everything. So it's in, in between, I'm, I'm sure you, you know, you've thought a lot about this and talked about this with people, but the last 10 years, we've just seen kind of this neoliberal students are customers. Everybody's a customer kind of mentality taking over higher ed. So it's like, I think it's even longer than 10 years, but ten, yeah, yeah, uh, that, uh, that trend has gotten really bad. So yeah, no, I mean, the competition is, is unreal and I don't know how much places are cutting back in terms of admitting people for, for grad programs. I think, you know, obviously there are some things COVID related where they said, we're not taking any students, but now that that's on the wane a bit, you know, I don't know if this is going to be business as usual. I talked to Eric Foner and I mean, obviously he's, you know, a household name and has all this experience. And he said, I, I tell people not to go to grad school anymore. Yeah, I, I've, I've I've told people not to go to grad school yeah. from day one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you know, for for, for 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 twenty years, I have you know undergraduates really? yeah. say they want to go to grad school, and I'm like, no, don't do that. Yeah, um, I'm even wondering know, or, about college generally. I mean, yeah, like, well, you know, that's a different question, but yeah. but you know, yeah, more broadly, I, I usually just tell them, I'm like, look, if you if you really want to go to grad school, go get a job, do something else for a couple of years, and if you find yourself you know, you can't get grad school out of your head and it's like you feel like this is really what you're supposed to do, then come back, you know, because often what happens is if you can get another job, it pays the bills, it does OK. And all of a sudden it's like, well, do I really want to throw this up in the air and go back to grad school? And if the answer is no or you're not even sure, then it's probably not something you should be doing because you got to be all in and know all the risks and be willing to take them. Um, and people who go straight from college just aren't they're not really prepared to make that decision. Now, people have the luxury of the internet and, you know, something like podcasts where, like, they can hear people talking about various industries. So you can get kind of a sense of, like, well, if I want to do this, what is this really going to be like for me? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, no, you that's a good do point. Your, you got to do your homework. But I mean, I, the world felt very, way bigger to me growing up. Like, and the, you know, I was, I was going off to college in the early 90s, mid 90s, and like, there's no Wikipedia. Like if you mm -hmm. were thinking about going to a place, you you couldn't really know much about it before you went. I mean, it was like going off the edge of a map to a certain degree. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to go south of New York City. Like what, what would that what would that be like? You know? <laughs> um, so I hopefully your know, kids can use the Internet to find more uh, information, just more opportunities. And again, you know, you could, you had to look at, through the Chronicle of Higher Education when that came out when I was yeah, in grad yeah. school. So, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, no, it's a, it's a very different world than the the one I grew up in, the one I went to grad school in. And um, I don't know. I mean, I, there's part of me that sort of says I I don't envy my own my own children having to to navigate so many more challenges. But the truth is that. They don't know any different. Like personally, right. wouldn't want to do it because I I don't have the kind of, I you know I I'm I'm re I am the last generation. So are you, I guess that are we're not digital natives, right? We had to learn this stuff. Right. But 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 you know everybody after us basically is a digital native. You know anyone who anyone who comes of age after about you know 1997, you know this is just the world that they know. Yeah. So you know. My my what? son is fit. My son is fifteen. He's starting to figure this stuff out. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So I, have, I, I have college on the a glimmer on the horizon. <laughs> I have a couple of tablet babies. I mean, they they're still young. Uh, one's turning six. The other is eight. But yeah, I mean, they grew up 
cell phones being everywhere. I try to keep yeah. them away from, you know, the the worst of that kind of stuff. But they have Netflix. Everything they watch is downloadable. And, oh, yeah. Um, I'm like, you know, I still remember I, – I hate saying this stuff because I sound like an old man. But it's like <laughs> – This I is remember... how we – I tell my wife this all the time. This is how we become old, right? No, I mean, I remember when you'd wake up early in the morning, they still have the American flag and the music playing, you know, like the TV didn't <laughs> didn't even start yet until like eight o'clock or whatever it was. Um, but no, I, I keep I, I, more and more. I feel like I'm saying these these kinds of stories of, uh, you know, we had to go uphill both ways and three feet yep. of snow to find our yep. jobs. Yeah. 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 But where are you from? Are you from the Northeast? I... I grew up in New York, yeah. Okay, because you went to Cornell, so I figured maybe I did, yeah. So I went north of New York City, not south of New York City. Okay, I went south of New York City for grad school. Okay, where where in New York are you from? I grew up on Staten Island. Okay, yeah. I just talked to um, uh, this guy Edward Packard, a, a writer. He was from Long Island, so okay. uh, yeah, I, I do bump into a lot of New York folks. But uh, you wanted to study Southern history, obviously. You went to UVA. I did. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was not something that I thought I, I you know, I'm not sure I thought about anything when I started undergraduate. Um, right. Yeah. Hi, hi, I'm, I'm not sure history was really on my radar. You know, I graduated from high school in the late 80s and pretty much everybody, everybody with, uh, uh, you know, every, every white kid, every white upper middle class kid was going to be a banker or a lawyer. Uh, so I figured I'd be a lawyer. Um, okay. and then I got to college. I was like, I really don't want to go to law school. <laughs> I don't want to be a yeah. lawyer. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I liked history before I started college and I just, I really got into it. I, I had an advisor who was a, uh, 19th century story and a political historian and kind of got into, you know, sort of antebellum coming of the civil war kind of stuff. And then that sort of morphed from there into, um, into studying slavery, um, it really was I, – it wasn't a plan. It wasn't something that I – if you'd asked me when I was 16, if you, I thought that would, I, that's what I would end up doing, I would have looked at you like you had a second head. You know, one thing leads to the next leads to the next, and now here I am, you know, 25 years later. I mean, obviously, Cornell is a great school. Did, did you do like an undergrad thesis? Were you that kind of kid? I did, yeah. So uh, like I said, I had – my advisor was, uh, was Joel Silby, who was a political historian for, for many years up at Cornell. And his work was really kind of political history in the sort of ethno history vein, right? He would look at how kind of different sort of, uh, uh, you know, Irish immigration and politics and, and a lot of, you know, sort of almost Michael Holt style of political okay. history. So I, I got into it through that way. Yeah, I mean, I wrote an honors thesis with him on um, on the political crisis, you know, the secession crisis. It was really it was very old fashioned. I mean, even for the time, it was it was nothing particularly cutting edge about it. It was, you know, I thought it was interesting, but it was really yeah. about, you know, national politicians trying to figure out a compromise that would avoid war. Uh, and it was fine. You know, I, I, I haven't read it since I wrote it, but, but, uh, but I, you know, I think, I think, I think it was probably fine. And look, yeah. and I went to, I went to UVA, I applied to UVA in part because I thought I was going to work with Michael Holt. Um, okay. And I ended up, by the time I got to grad school, my interests had sort of started to turn a little bit from political history towards social history and sort of, you know, I, I ended up working with Ed Ayers instead. I definitely was a, a history major, honors thesis you know, by the time I was a junior, I, I was like, maybe I'll go to grad school. So that's I, I really I, with hindsight, the fact that my career ended up the way it did is sort of ridiculous because I really just sort of stumbled from one stage to the next. Yeah, that sounds familiar. But um, yeah, I've, I've had Michael Holt on the podcast. I've had. Editors. Oh, yeah. Um, so that that's great. I, I like getting, you know, sort of the, the students of these people that, you know, I've been reading for a long time and kind of see how they're doing. I've had, you know, Gallagher on and the Gallagher students. And sure. Obviously, UVA looms large uh, in Virginia and, and beyond. But um, 
was your undergrad advisor, was he kind of like an old school guy? Was he like smoking in his office and stuff like that? Or he was, he, he, <laughs> I, you know, he didn't smoke in his office. I, I, okay. there, there, I, you know, Holt was a guy who smoked in his office. Okay. Uh, okay. Holt was probably the last, very last faculty member at UVA who like, you know, they pass rules about you're not allowed to smoke in your office and right. Holt smoked, Holt smoked a pipe. And he just didn't give a shit if there were rules about smoking in the office. Yeah. He'd go in his office and like you could tell he'd been smoking a pipe in his office. <laughs> yeah. No, Joel Silvey was was definitely you know look he was an old school kind of guy, but he wasn't sort of you know uh, um, kind of flaunting his old schoolness. Sure, he wasn't like yeah. that. Holt Holt was definitely a guy who like you know reveled in being uh, um, a bit um, retrograde's not the right word, but definitely somebody he he reveled in being sort of hidebound. He liked that. Yeah. Well, I think his advisor was David Donald. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I've talked to a lot of people who worked with Donald and I can never get them to really, I I don't know. I I always heard kind of horror stories about David Donald and none (laughs) none of them will ever cop to that. I think he was just kind of one of those guys like he was a, from what they've told me, like he's kind of a tough but fair dude. Like you didn't want to misstep with him. But he would get you a job and he was a really good advisor, you know, right. editor, writer, all that stuff. So they've, they've said good things about him. But yeah, I, again, like, you know, kind of talking about last generation. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I had two advisors, one in undergrad and then grad school, Charles Royster. Like they didn't even, oh, have yeah, com- sure. didn't even have computers, still using typewriters. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think yeah, you know, Royster, those... I never met I never met Charlie, but he was okay. every everything people told me about him. He was very he was old school. Yeah, he's an he was an intense intense dude. Um, but uh, it sounds like you just sort of moved. You went right into grad school then. Out of I Cornell. did, yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's the other thing is like my my you know with hindsight, you know the fact that I did that was crazy. I mean I I I went straight from college to graduate school. Um, you know I graduated Cornell a semester early, so I I had a, a gap from like you know January to August basically. Um, but yeah, I went straight to graduate school. I finished graduate. I got my my PhD. I finished it in five and a half years. Uh, got a job. You know, went straight to here. Uh, I've had this is my only job. Yeah. Um, you know, I got this job. I was 28 years old, easily the youngest person in my department. You know, people thought I was a grad student for a while. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. It, yeah. It's, it's you know my my path is sort of a um, it it there there are definitely some sort of comical em- elements about it with hindsight. I've just been very lucky that sort of everything, you know, one step led to the next, led to the next, which is how they tell you it's going to work, but it almost never does. Yeah, I've, I've seen you've been there for a while, um, and you worked with Ed Ayer. So your first book, was that based on your dissertation? Yeah, my first book was based on my dissertation. That's Notorious right. in the Neighborhood, yeah. Sex and Families Across the Color Line, Virginia. Okay, so the Virginia topic, so you did a lot of research at UVA, I'm guessing? A lot of research at the Library of Virginia. Uh, so okay. I spent a lot of time driving back and forth from Charlottesville to Richmond. I, I did that. I did that probably three days a week for – six months or a year. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, no, it's the kind of thing you only do when you're 25 years old and in graduate school <laughs> because, uh, yeah. you know, I don't know if you've ever done that drive, but it's, um, you know, it's an hour and a quarter yeah. each way. So it's just long enough that it really sucks. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, I have a commute but, like that now. I have to go. Yeah. To and Sydney. it's like, you can, you know, 30, 45 minutes is not too bad. Yeah. An hour starts to feel long, but like 75 minutes is like, Jesus, really? Still doing this? <laughs> um, and so I would never do that today. But, you know, yeah. in graduate school, it's just what you did. No, I know. It's it's a very kind of monkish experience in a lot of yeah. ways. I mean, you just completely yeah. immerse yourself. But, yeah, it's like if it were any further, you would have just like gotten an apartment here or something. Right, you know? right. Exactly. Exactly. It was just close enough that, that you know, and I didn't have the money to, to get a hotel room for – multiple nights a week yeah you know, I, I i had i had fellowships but i didn't have like extra money sitting around but again with hindsight you sort of look at it and be like okay well how much did you pay in gas going back and forth three days a week surely you could have saved that and just got a hotel room instead for one night which maybe is right but it didn't i don't know it didn't seem that didn't seem to make sense that way at the time 
when you're young, you just kind of go for it. You're just like, yeah, whatever. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, you and, go and you, you sleep on floors and couches and you don't care. And Having that time. I mean, that was one great thing about grad school is that sense of time that you had. Where just going, oh, yeah. No, being ABD was great. Yeah, uh, it really it was. Uh, yeah, no, you know, it was. I, I would never. I, 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 you know, the the there's so much anxiety in graduate school now that I don't think anyone now would say that. But for me, like those couple of years of being ABD, they were the best. They were amazing. I, yeah. I had a great time. Yeah, I I did too. A little a little too good, I, I think, in a way. <laughs> it was just stretching things out, and you know, three o'clock happy hours and stuff yep, like that. Yeah. We were all on different schedules. Some some of my friends were morning people, and I was not. So if I didn't have any discipline that day, you know, I'd meet them. They're done with their work at three o'clock. Like the day's over. You just right. shoot the shit the rest of the day. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. gone. Yeah, there's but... definitely a lot of that. You know, you go <laughs> go play basketball for two hours in the morning, something yeah. like that. Uh, just you know, shit that I would never do now. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's not enough time. Yeah, no, I know. Well, and you got you have kids and. I have kids now and it's just like trying to squeeze in time and you're a department head, you said, right? I am. Yeah. yeah. Um, so does this feel like the year that, that will never end? Oh God, does it ever? This, uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, 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 I am, uh, uh, you know, neck deep in faculty activity reports and my annual report and end of the year stuff that, I'm usually able to clear out pretty much by the time finals are over. I'm usually so on top of this stuff that, that, you know, my summer starts when everybody else's does, but not this year. Yeah. Um, and did they uh, do remote learning or was it in person? It's sort of a mix. So, so okay. my classes were all, were all on zoom because I was just teaching graduate classes and sort of it, it, they, they could have been in person, but it would have been, you know, 12 of us in a cavernous room all wearing masks sort of yelling so we could make each other heard. Right. And it just, it would, it worked fine by zoom, you know, a 12 person seminar works fine by zoom. So I never had to do the, the hybrid thing, but a lot of my, a lot of my faculty did some did in person, some were online, some were mix. Yeah. I mean, this year, honestly, more than anything else, what it, what it feels like both from my faculty and from Definitely from my graduate students and from what I hear for undergraduates, it's just a year that it just really wore people down, I think, yeah. in ways that, that you know, given that people don't have to leave the house as much, you wouldn't think would be true. The university got rid of spring break because they didn't want people going and coming back. And so it really was just sort of – it had a kind of relentlessness to it, to its pace, <laughs> right. that even a normal semester that can feel that way, it felt that way and then some. Um, yeah. And so it's just there's there's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety and just sheer exhaustion by this point. No, I I mean that people were able to get through it is, is a real testament to their fortitude. But Absolutely. yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I've been able to work from home a lot, which has been really nice, but I really haven't had a vacation either. And yeah. so like what you're saying, it's just kind of this mental exhaustion, just because waiting for May. I've just been like. And I'm moving on to a new job anyway, so I'm just like, I need I need to move on, you know, but like yeah. it's <laughs> dragging and dragging. Yeah, no, um, I think a lot of people feel that way. And just, um, you know, this week, this today is actually the last day of finals. Tomorrow's graduation. Okay. And I think everybody is very ready just to, you know, look, we, we, we survived, right? You know, we made it through this year. You know, I, I can only speak from my own experience. My faculty were amazing. You know, the the the, the number of sort of, problems and complaints and all sorts of things were you know they existed obviously and some of them were very covid specific but by and large you know my, my faculty did what they had to do and the students did what they had to do and and i think we're just I, but i but i do think that moving forward we all look at the fall and we're like this cannot happen again like we can't do this for a third semester in a row yeah um yeah and i think that's right i, I don't i don't know what would happen you know if something goes really really badly over the um you know over the summer and and numbers start to go in the opposite direction again and it looks like they're going to have to do more shutdowns which i think is unlikely at this point but if that starts to happen people are really going to lose their shit yeah i think they're just going to go for it uh, across the board and you know my oldest daughter she's been doing remote learning and hates mm -hmm. it and i totally understand that so i think in the fall what, yeah, I mean, unless there's catastrophic numbers like we had in January, December, 
yeah, we're just going to have the kids masked in, in person and mm -hmm. and hope for the best because you can't fall another year behind. I mean, yeah, no, Mike, I've been we've been very lucky. You know, my kids go to go to pretty small schools. And so they've been able to manage mostly yeah. in person. The fall was a my son has actually been in school basically the whole year. My daughter was sort of in and out for a lot of the fall and even into the early spring. But now, you know, they're they're they've been back in school mostly. Um, and yeah, I mean, my, you know, my, my daughter just particularly, you know, she, she, she had stretches where she was like, I, I really don't feel like going to school. I'd rather be online. And then she would do it for maybe a week or so. And she'd be like, I have to go back to school. Yeah. You know, and yeah. she's in like fifth grade. Right. So it's the kind of thing where like a fifth grader can be like, I'm just going to stay home and, you know, be on the computer all day. You'd think they'd love it, but they do not love it. No, ab absolutely. And I'm kind of the opposite these days now. It's like I don't want to leave the house anymore. Yeah, so. well, I think a lot of us are, you know, we get to a point where it's like, you know, I I kind of like working in sweatpants every day. Right. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, no, I don't I don't miss having to go into the office every day, but I miss being able to see people. You know, I, I think it'll be a while before we can, you know, everything is just the way it was. And maybe it won't be the way it was again, but, you know, Alabama – being what it is, you know, football is the football stadium is going to be wide open in the fall. Sure. Um, and, you know, I'm going to I'll probably still wear a mask, but I'm going to the games. I'm going to go sit with 100,000 people outside and I'm 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 vaccinated. I'm going to wear a mask. It'll be fine. Yeah, I've I already had made plans to go. You know, we're not that far from Baltimore. So, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I, I did it late September. So I waited about, a, you know, as far into the season as possible to see a game. But yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm not going to be too worried. Yeah, I mean, I've been vaccinated and it'll be outdoors and it should be fine. Now, having gone from like, you know, New York City to you've in Staten Island is its own kind of thing. But going from like, <laughs> yeah, it, it sure is. <laughs> uh, that's it its sure own is. little world. But like going yeah. from there to UVA to Alabama, it's like there been culture shock along the way like how was it when you first got into the south had you had you been there before you no, went to no not really not yeah. really um i certainly had never been to to the deep south you know my research was in virginia you know i i had spent some time in virginia when i was a kid but no i really i really had not i mean i'm trying to think even you know before i graduated from college had i ever even been to like you know, North Carolina. And I, I don't know that I had, you know, I was, I was very much a Northeastern kid through and through, but you know, it's, it's funny. I, I never, I don't think I ever really experienced full on culture shock. And I think that's because I think in part, that's because I sort of eased my way toward the South, right? Charlottesville is, is Southern, but not really southern rex it's a it's, right, a, it's right. sort of southern college town and that's its own sort of little bubble it was definitely not new york city but it but it also wasn't you know uh it's also not rural mississippi either but i think more than anything else rather it, it wasn't just that kind of gradual transition it was the fact that i studied the south you know i, I think studying a place while you're in it you know you go to a place like alabama and sure you realize that alabama is a south that's not like the charlottesville south but you know a fair or at least i knew you know a fair amount about the history of the place and and kind of what the culture was like it was something that i had committed myself to to not only studying but to being a part of like this was going to be my life now because it was something that that appealed to me that i thought was important to know about everybody everybody who works in the south and i think most people who are who, particularly liberal people who are from the South, they have this very love-hate relationship with the South. It's a very, it's a cliche basically to have a love-hate relationship with the South. Yeah. Um, and I, and honestly, I developed that very, very quickly, even though I'm not from the South, I would never make a case that I am Southern, but I also have that kind of love-hate relationship with the place. Like I, I, I think the South is absolutely wonderful. And yet, man, there's things about it and it's past that are just they're really hard to, to, to sit with. So, yeah, no, I, I think the, 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 what made the, the culture shock element easier for me and something I never really experienced was the fact that I'd already immersed myself in, in the history and culture of the place before I ever got here. Yeah. And I think probably, you know, moving to the South, it, it maybe makes you rethink too. I mean, where you grew up and kind of how you perceived your surroundings and your upbringing. Cause in a lot of ways, like, 
wherever you're from, it's sort of a love hate relationship. But yeah, you travel a little true. bit. That you know that gives you some perspective. I know that's a bi- that's a big cliche too. But you know, in grad school, we studied this kind of whole idea of regionalism, and and mm-hmm. to a certain degree, like does it even really exist? Because mm-hmm. a lot of what people say about the South, they could say about Staten Island or Boston yep. or yep. the and entire I, and country. I have, as and, a whole. I, and I have made that argument through more than one book. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that being said, I, yeah, I think there's there is something distinctive about being in the South, even if a lot of it's made up or self-referential. I mean, you're just not going to see huge Confederate battle flags flying on your way to work in Framingham, Mass. I mean, it's just, it is a different place. That's an extreme example, but I'm sure it felt different for you. And again, going from UVA to Alabama, I mean, Alabama is its own thing and you're like in the heart of it there Yeah. and football being one huge difference. I mean, that really kind of was astounding to me when I got to LSU and seeing not just the college football culture, but also the the high school football culture, which is, I mean, it's insane. Yeah. Um, I have not really immersed myself in, in that very much, but yeah, I mean, you know, I look, I grew up, you know, big sports fan but you know new york is not a place where college football is really a big deal um you know i follow i followed college football when i was a kid i i you know i remember watching you know the the whatever year i guess it was sort of the 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 92 championship game you know with where, where alabama was in it and you know i remember when i was a kid i remember bear bryant i remember when bear bryant died and that was big news but yeah, okay. until I got here, I never really appreciated not just the intensity, but how consuming football culture is. And I don't say that as a criticism because, look, I, I've gone completely native on that. You know, I, I, I love Alabama football. I go to I go to all the games when I can. Um, I, you know, I, I find the, the culture of it, you know, there, there's a lot of things about that are a lot of fun, but it is, uh, but it is vastly, vastly different from, from what you see in other parts of the country. Um, SEC football is pretty intense. Yeah. I don't think it gets much bigger than Alabama. I mean, there are, yeah, but the, yeah, the whole SEC, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. I mean, LSU yeah. is insane. Yeah. No, LSU is, I mean, I, Miss. I, I, I've been, you know, I was actually before COVID, I mean, I was going to go to the, to the game in death Valley last year. Um, and you know, that, that got sort of the kibosh got put on that, but, um, but you know, when LSU fans come here, you know, I've been to plenty of LSU Alabama games over the years and, um, you know, they're, they're just as bananas about football as we are oh, yeah. Um, yeah. In, in some, in some ways, even more, you know, every what's, it's fascinating because every, every school's fan base has its own sort of tailgating and football culture and LSU is, is arguably the most over the top in all the sec you know the the fans are 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 the most aggressive the fan base is you know alabama fans just they can't stand lsu fans it's driving bananas right, right. Um, and i think that goes probably both ways yeah no it was i was not used to that at all i mean i was a pro sports you know growing up in massachusetts so i loved all the boston teams right but, right i mean college football there was like the one year with doug flutie mm-hmm. won the heisman but i mean other i remember that, that remember that game too the the, the miami game yeah it was a great game yeah. i'll never yep. forget that game but um no it's a it's a whole nother i mean the baton rouge are pretty much just shut down on saturday oh yeah oh yeah no i i live uh you know I, our house in tuscaloosa is about six eight blocks from the stadium uh oh wow and yeah so saturdays are game days you know you just if you're not going to the game just don't you don't, know, leave, don't the leave the house, house. <laughs> um or if you're gonna leave the house go during the game yeah, right? if you need to go to the grocery store, go during the game because there's not going to be anybody there but you. That's true. Yeah. Well, like people just like park on your lawn. I mean, it was just like an all-consuming tailgating party. <laughs> yeah, they, parking saying. parking is its own thing. Yeah, <laughs> people yeah. P- would like charge people to park in their lawn too. Oh yeah. So see, oh you know? yeah. I you know we have we have you know people who live up the street from us. They've got a huge backyard, and yeah, they'll sell you know twenty thirty spaces in their backyard for I don't know what. Last last time I saw it was maybe thirty dollars a slot, um, <laughs> and people will pay it. You know? Yeah, I know, I know. It's capitalism at its at its finest. <laughs> it's like a, adult lemonade stand. You know? Yeah, it's part yeah, of your, yeah. your your suburban on my uh, mailbox. It's fine. Well, in looking at your books, I see kind of a theme. I mean, you you start with. I mean, I know you you focus on the nineteenth century, but. It seems like you've kind of maintained this theme. Well, I don't know. Would you kind of call yourself a cultural historian? 
or uh, I how- think of myself if I had to sort of put myself in a category. I I, I think consistently I'm I'm more of a social historian. Social historian. Okay. Um, you know, I'm I'm definitely someone who spends a lot of time in archives going through, you know, property deeds and tax records and and you know census returns and you know whatever I can find to sort of piece together tiny bits of information about people who didn't leave a lot of information behind. And I'm working up to to your most recent book. Yeah, I mean, you you had this, your second book was Reforming America. Were you kind of like a a Hofstetter guy in grad school? Because that just kind of reminds me, you know, Reforming America, that whole idea, like the age of reform and stuff. Yeah, Um, you know, that that book is really much more of a um, sort of a document collection where I've got, you know, uh, uh, you know, I wrote an introduction and I've got sort of, you know, uh, uh, introduction to sort of each of each of a bunch of documents there, um, and that that was something that really grew out of a, a really an undergraduate course that I teach on the history of reform movements. And you know, it, it's interesting. I'm not. I can't even remember how exactly I got into teaching that course. I think it really was. Um, you know, I think in the course of teaching the survey, I got really interested in things like, you know, not just abolitionism and early, you know, sort of first wave feminism, but the, the, the some of the stranger ones, right? I mean, I got, I found things like phrenology and hydropathy and some of these utopian communities. And I just, the fact that the, all of these things are sort of happening at once to me, I mean, that was something that that if you look at all of these kinds of movements, you have all these weird angles that give you insight into antebellum American culture. And so, yeah, I mean, I think to the extent that I would ever think of myself as a cultural historian, those kinds of interests are where that sort of manifests itself. That period you're talking about, you do see a lot of dovetailing of you know, the temperance movement, abolitionism, yeah, feminism. Yeah. You know, again, kind of, you know, your first book talking about sex and family, I mean, and obviously the color line, it's right in the title, but like, you do see a lot of that and the ledger in the chain, too. I mean, you're, you're really kind of getting deep into the slave trade and how it kind of works at a human level. Hey, everybody, this is Colin Woodward, the host of the American Rambler podcast. I want to tell you about a few ways you can support this podcast. One is by going to patreon.com and contributing to the production of the podcast. I don't want to get into all the details, but podcasting is not free. Even though the content is free, there's money in microphones and subscriptions and batteries and every other thing you can think of dealing with technology. So helping me out on Patreon would be greatly appreciated. You can go to patreon.com slash American Rambler and you can contribute whatever you want but whatever you can do uh, would really help out with this I want to keep doing this podcast and talking with interesting folks and allowing you to listen to it for free but if you don't want to do that there are other ways you can support me you can go to iTunes and leave a five star review I've got a few reviews there and Uh, I'm grateful for those, but more will help with the podcast. I don't know how that all works with analytics and everything, but the more reviews, the better you can do as a podcaster. So if you have the time, please leave a review on iTunes. And the last thing, you can buy my book, Marching Masters, Slavery, Race, and the Confederate Army During the Civil War. It is a book that has been well-reviewed in the major publications of the South and the Civil War. The book is available on Amazon and other internet retailers. You can get it for $39.95 for the hardcover as well as $29 for the Kindle. Or you can contact me and get a copy for $30. That includes shipping. That's $10 less than the Amazon version, which is going to cost more than $40 with the tax. So... If you want to save a few bucks, you can contact me and I will sign it for you and ship it to you. You don't have to do anything other than just contacting me and asking. Again, thank you for your support and let's get back to the show. It's weird. I haven't read a lot of books about the slave trade. I think Walter Johnson's book I read a long time ago, but you seem to kind of want to put a very human spin on it. 
Is is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think, look, there's been – if you look at the, the, the literature in the last – you know, 10, 15 years. And if you want to go back to, to Walter's book, I'd say, uh, you know, 20 years, right? I mean, that book came out in 1999. Um, and that, you know, really, the, you know, you follow Walter's book and you get books like, um, you know, like Steve Daly's book and and um, uh, Robert Goodenstead's book and Calvin Shammerhorn's book. And, you know, you get this sort of wave of stuff about the domestic slave trade. And so there is a, 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 a almost a revival of the, the literature on the subject, but um, but a lot of them are. I, I think what drew me to to this particular book and this subject really had to do with the with slave traders themselves. They're the sort of the, the, these kind of figures who who are in all of these books, and yet trying to figure out sort of who they are, where they come from, what are their lives like, why do they do what they do, um, you know, what does it mean to do that day after day what do you do after you get out of the slave trade um i felt like we really didn't know the answers to a lot of those questions um all the work on the slave trade sort of hovered around those questions without ever really landing on them and so that's that's kind of what i was trying to do was to really you know sort of and and to try to not only look at the the business operations but to try to figure out if we were going to narrate that right if we were going to tell that as a story what would that look like? Let's talk about the ledger in the chain. I mean, um, about halfway through, I mean, it's 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 a very well written book, and and the research you did is is really impressive too. So it, it it reads pretty fast. Kind of maybe put things in context, like for people that don't know much about the domestic slave trade, um, you're you're kind of beginning your story. I mean, the first decade or two of of the nineteenth century. Maybe just kind of talk about how the slave trade evolves and like how we sort of see this development in in the south in the in the jacksonian period sure so you know look there there's a domestic slave trade that you know exists in the in the colonial era right people are people enslaved people are bought and sold in the colonies um it certainly extends into the revolutionary period and beyond uh really what sort of the turning point for the domestic trade in the United States is is a few things that are all they're not happening simultaneously, but there is a there is a, a coincidence of of factors. You know, there is the ban on the transatlantic trade, which is instituted in in eighteen oh eight, and so white farmers in the United States, if they if they want more enslaved laborers, if they want to uh, uh, in, you know increase their workforce, they need to get slaves domestically. Um, it's the only way to do it legally, at least. So that is one thing that provides an incentive for domestic traders to get into business, right? There, there, there's a service that is that is needed, um, and they think they can make some money providing that service. There is the invention of the cotton gin and the expansion into the Southwest, into places like Alabama, Mississippi, uh, northern Louisiana. You know, the the cotton gin and the the growth of the cotton economy provides yet more incentive for the expansion of slavery. Uh, it creates even more demand for enslaved laborers. Um, so that's really starting to happen kind of 1790s, early 1800s. Um, you get the War of 1812 uh, following up on the Louisiana Purchase. You get uh, increased Indian dispossession and expulsion. Um, you get another wave of that that happens with the election of Andrew Jackson. Um, and so by the time you sort of looked at how things have played out over the course of the first, you know, 20 or 30 years of the 19th century, you know, what slavery had been an institution that looked like it might be sort of dwindling in significance in the late 18th century. And then all of a sudden, over the course of really just a couple of decades, you have all sorts. It's a, it's a different economy. It's a different landscape. It's a different set of economic incentives. And all of it moves in the direction of making slavery more valuable than it ever was, of making opportunities for slave traders more prevalent than they'd ever been before. Um, and that's really where Franklin and Armfield kind of come into things in the late 1820s. And these are – they are – we'll talk about them. Who who are they exactly and like what, what are the – where are they setting up shop in the slave trade? So the book is really about – 
three people, three protagonists at least, um, Isaac Franklin, John Armfield, and Rice Ballard. Um, Franklin and Armfield uh, create a company, a slave trading company together in the late 1820s. They bring Rice Ballard in as a third partner in the early 1830s. And these are men who had been slave traders before they started operating together. Um, Isaac Franklin in particular had been a slave trader really for the better part of 20 years by the late 1820s. I mean, he's, he's from a, a farming family in frontier Tennessee. His older brothers had been involved in the slave trade before him. He really starts getting involved really as a teenager in the, in the late in the first decade of the 19th century. He meets John Armfield in 1824. They sort of kind of hover around each other in the business for a few years. They get to know each other over time, and they decide that they're going to create a company and um, and really go into the long-distance slave trade together. And they and they go really big, right? They put a ton of money in. Armfield uh, rents a, a, a big townhouse in Alexandria, Virginia, Franklin has a place down in Natchez, Mississippi that he'd been working from for a few years by that point. And they they immediately start, you know, acquiring enslaved people, sometimes walking them over land, often sending them by ship in the coastal trade down the Atlantic into the Gulf of Mexico and up through New Orleans. And pretty quickly they emerge as as kind of leading regional players, particularly in the Chesapeake of, you know, one of the one of the largest domestic slave trading companies in the country, really, within the first couple of years of operation. You've, so you've got a few big cities. You've got Alexandria and northern Virginia, where it kind of all starts just outside of D.C. And then you have Natchez and kind of New Orleans. Are these kind of the three the three main cities that they're operating in? Well, and then when they bring Ballard on board and Ballard is someone who had also been working in the long distance domestic trade. And that's sort of how he gets to know Franklin and Armfield, right? All of these guys are kind of working in the same markets. Um, but when they bring him on board as a partner, they set him up in Richmond. So I, I you know, of okay. the, the kind of, 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 of the big locations that are, that are at play in this book. Um, yeah. I'd say you've got sort of Alexandria and Richmond in the, in the Chesapeake and you've got Natchez in New Orleans in the lower South. And those are, those are kind of the main uh, uh, sort of nodes of operation for this for this business. OK. And and as you said, sort of slavery is is either kind of dwindling or leveling off in the upper south, Maryland, Virginia. So the the planters and slave owners in Virginia are selling their surplus slaves essentially to the deep south where there's a higher demand. Is that that's generally kind of what's happening. Yeah, that's that's the general trajectory, right? I mean, the the what had made slavery so powerful in the Chesapeake for so long, really from the early colonial era, um, is the tobacco economy, and right. that that is um, you know it's a major driving force of the economy for you know for a century and a half, really. But by the time you get to the era of the American Revolution, you know, t- tobacco is a crop that that sort of drains the soil. It it was sort of becoming less profitable over time. It had become less profitable than it had been in the early colonial period for a long time, in fact. But what had starts to happen in the revolutionary period and then afterward is it, it the economy had been in decline for some time. There are trade disruptions as a consequence of the revolution. You know, the, the tobacco economy never really bounces back in the Chesapeake in the same way. Chesapeake farmers start turning their 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 crops over to things like wheat and corn that are less labor intensive. And so all of a sudden they find themselves with more enslaved laborers than they feel like they can employ in their fields. They are often in situations where they need money. Slave traders basically come to them and say, well, you know, we'll, we'll take off your hands any people who you are, are willing to part with. Um, and that that, you know, Couple that with the demand from cotton growers and and to a somewhat similar extent from sugar growers uh, in Louisiana. Yeah, I mean you've got supply coming out of the Chesapeake. You've got enormous demand in the Lower South, and that's effectively the dynamic at play there. Maybe you dealt with this some of the, in some of your earlier work, but like in grad school, you read uh, you know Eugene Genovese and, and some other folks and talking about slavery, and they maybe 
it, well, like Genovese was writing the, like the Marxist school, but he had the whole idea of paternalism versus capitalism, I guess. When did, did you grapple with those issues early on? Did you have to take on Genovese at some point? Or because because here, you, I mean, you don't necessarily get into the historiography in this book. It's kind of more you know, descriptive and, and getting into your sources and stuff. But, um, you know, looking back in grad school or whatever, did you have to kind of grapple those issues in the historiography? Sure. Yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, I remember my, my very first year in graduate school, my first semester in graduate school, you know, we read uh, we read Roll, Jordan, Roll. Uh, we read Jim Oaks' uh, um, The Ruling Race, um, and they were sort of paired together as this, you know, as that, that old debate between paternalism and capitalism. I, I don't think the, the full applications of that really sunk in for me when I was, you know, first year graduate student, but it is certainly something that I have grappled with in the course of in the course of my career, probably not a huge amount with my first book, but certainly with my second book, which was about uh, the expansion of the cotton south and the growth of the cotton frontier. And, and you know, as I kind of gravitated toward what has come to be called the new history of capitalism, I really don't have I don't have a lot of patience for paternalism as as an idea. I I, I understand and appreciate that there were certainly white slaveholders who indulged that idea, who fancied themselves as as paternalists, who kind of imagined their own uh, their own fiefdoms and their own domains as as that that's how it operated. I think if you actually look at how slavery operates in practice. And paternalism is a sham, right? It's yeah, it's, right. it's 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 a totally kind of self-serving and a false ideology. It's just it simply doesn't reflect the way that that slavery actually operated. It certainly doesn't reflect the experience of most enslaved people. Look, and I think in the in the, the macro sense, at least, the idea that slavery is somehow not capitalistic. I also don't think flies very much. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think these are issues that I that I certainly have thought about, that I certainly am familiar with, and have dealt with, and and teach. But in terms of my own work, I think it's pretty clear which side of that divide I come down on. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I mean, this is really kind of capitalism at its worst. I mean, if you're commodifying human beings, I mean, this is. I mean, that, that, that's often been sort of the trajectory of my argument. And look, there are counter arguments to that, right? I mean, there are all sorts of ideas about what actually is capitalism, like yeah, theoretically right. and practically. What, you know, can you, can, you, can you have a system where you don't have a lot of free labor and still call it capitalist? There are lots of ways of having this argument. But yes, I mean, my, my, my take on it has always been that, in fact, what you see in slavery, particularly in slavery in places like the, the most sort of cot, you know, cotton intensive parts of the country, what you see in some ways is capitalism on steroids. You know, that that's that's sort of my own kind of sense of of of, of the way this reads to me. Yeah, I mean and I think it, it took me kind of a while to under, understand this idea. And you're right, I mean there's there's some arguments that can be made against slavery as being, you know, fully capitalist, whatever sure. that whatever that may mean. But right. I mean, I kind of use yeah, I mean these slave traders they're kind of like a shorthand for like the worst kind of profit-minded people imaginable. I mean, they're just heartlessly, cruelly making money off these people. They're driving across the country. You know, if they lose a few along the way, I mean, they don't care as long as, long as they get paid. Um, and I, th I think you do a great job with, you know, providing these details of kind of how these guys operate, how they think. Um, there's a lot of, you know, sexual stuff where they're just, you know, using these women however they want. And, you know, I don't remember that in Genovese or, or other, but, you know, it's like you're just not really getting the reality of this in a lot of history books. I mean, this is really kind of the worst, the worst aspects of slavery, would you say, is the trade? You know, that's a really interesting question, because on the one hand, you know, that was what that was really what both white slaveholders said at the time. And in some ways, it was what abolitionists said at the time, right? That that yeah. that that they they sort of say, well, the slave trade is really slavery at its absolute worst, right? It's totally even if you wanted to indulge the 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 delusion of paternalism, you can't really sustain that when you're looking at the slave trade in any way, right? Because there's no the kind of personalism that that theoretically at least would make paternalism work. And I'm not saying it does because I don't think it does, but 
But even in theory, like the personalism that sustains that simply doesn't exist with the slave trade. So, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, all you know, the slave trade is is at its core about about profit. It's it entails, um, you know, breaking apart slave families as a matter of course. I mean, that's just what makes it work. So on the one hand, I, I, I you want to sort of say, well, yeah, slave, slave, the slave trade is slavery at its worst. But at the same time, I actually would push back a little bit on that. Only to the extent that I think the slave trade is crystallizing things that are part of what makes slavery work generally, right? I I don't think that you know even even if you the slave trade sort of takes things like family separation, like rape, like exploitation of labor, like profit seeking, and it it intensifies all of that. But it's not like if you get outside the slave trade, those things didn't exist in slavery. Those things were part and parcel of slavery every single day and every place, right? Um, even if you went to, to you know, a giant plantation somewhere, uh, the sexual exploitation of women is, is, is a constant factor. The exploitation of labor is a constant factor. The threat of being sold is a constant factor. The pressure coming from white slaveholders to make a profit. Uh, uh, is a constant factor. The violence is a constant factor. So I actually think that you know, saying that the slave trade is is sort of the worst of American slavery. There's a way in which that's true, but there's a way in which the sla- all the slave trade does is point up everything else about slavery, and it just makes it more visible. Yeah, that well, that's an interesting way of, of thinking about it, and and I guess that maybe proves true for the slave traders themselves, right? I mean, they're maybe not any better or worse than your typical, not typical, I don't know, like than a lot of plantation owners, right? I mean, they're just sort of doing what the master class is essentially doing everywhere. Is well, let's put it this way. Sla- the, 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 the master class liked to say that they were a lot better than slave traders. Were, right. Right. I mean, that was sort of their <laughs> right. standard. That's their standard line, right? Is that the yeah. slave traders are, are the, the really the worst people and we're a lot better than that. But are they really? <laughs> right. um, if you right. actually look at say, okay, over the course of time, what are the kinds of things that you did in running a plantation and enslaving, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 people over the course of, you know, over the course of your entire adult life? Did you really never do the things that slave traders do? Slave traders just did them every day. But, you know, does it really matter if you stretched out these things over 10 or 20 years as opposed to, you know, six months? I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't see how you sustain a really powerful moral distinction there. Slaveholders certainly tried to do it, but I just I don't know. I don't really find it that persuasive at all. Yeah, no. Well, and, and you're not going to get anywhere listening to the white rationalizations about it because right. everyone that's writing about it later is saying, you know, well, I never sold my slaves and I treated them well. And right, yeah, and we all know, and we and we know, stuff. but basically, you look at the records like this is not true. Right. You know, it's it's comforting to 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 white people to tell themselves that. But if you look at how how slavery and and how most you know slaveholding operations worked, I mean, you can tell yourself that if you want, but you're telling yourself a lie. Yeah. Well, there. Yeah. There's a lot of that to sort of <laughs> sustain this, and um, even something where it's sort of inadvertent. I mean, if somebody dies and there's essentially an estate sale and their slaves get sold off, sure. It's, you yeah. Know, that's another aspect of this. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I I tell this to 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 my students when I talk about this, which is, look, you know, there were plenty of slaveholders who who like to say that they didn't separate families. There were lots of slaveholders who said that they, you know, they really don't like selling people. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't something they liked to do. But if they go into debt and they need to sell off enslaved people in order to to save themselves, does it really matter whether they like doing it or not? Does it really matter whether they did it a lot or whether they only did it sometimes? Like I just I, I just don't – I don't know. I, I, I don't see that – certainly the, the people who were being sold didn't care whether you felt good about it or not. Um, I just <laughs> – right, I, I, right. yeah, I mean I, I just don't yeah. see that as a really – I get why people said that, and I get why they feel that way, and I don't think it's unimportant that they said that and felt that way as a matter of understanding the way their society worked. But do I feel like that – reflects a, a kind of reality of what slavery was. No. The reality is when they go into debt and people have to be sold at auction. That's what slavery is. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly kind of bring this stuff home and and following these guys around. It's, it kind of feels like a novel. I mean, just this, the amount of detail you're, you're able to provide about how these guys are thinking and operating is, is really impressive. Um, well, thank you. I mean, I, you know, look, I, I want I want this. To, I know that this book is a book that's going to be really, really challenging to read. Right. It was hard to write. It's difficult subject matter. Um but but I, I wanted to write it in a way that I think, um, you know, a, anyone, anyone, uh, uh, you know, above a certain age, obviously, I wouldn't recommend this to like, you know, middle schooler, but anyone who's, you know, even in high school, like if you're if you're if you're prepared kind of mentally to kind of grapple with this subject matter, there's nothing in this book that that is going to be too challenging uh, uh, for you to get your head around. There's nothing in the narrative that's really sort of filled with 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 difficult terminology. I really wanted to tell this in a way that that is narrative, and so that would be very accessible to as many people as possible. Well, and I wonder is is there any kind of modern analogy uh, with these guys? I mean, I think maybe like you know you sort of have drug dealers on the one hand, and then people that are using their drugs on the other. It's kind of like drug dealers have this. Uh, you know, stamp on them of they're they're not great guys, but this is coming from people that are buying drugs from them or whatever. <laughs> like, do you kind of see this maybe with the slave trade? Like, how embedded was this idea of slave traders being kind of nasty, sleazy people, or was it not really like that in terms of like so popular? I think opinion? the I- the idea is embedded. I think it's something that. White slaveholders certainly said all the time, and they and they would say it for a long time after slavery was over. I think when you actually look at how the slave trade operates, you know, I put it this way: Look, I think there's a, a fair amount of disdain for kind of small time operators, right? Uh, slave traders who, you know, you didn't really know where they came from. They might show up with people from from who knows where. They'd show up in a town. They'd sit at a bar. You know, they they'd sell people for, you know, whatever they could get as a, if they could make a profit and get some cash. They'd sell people, and then they were gone, right? They'd leave town, and and you'd never see them again. And so yeah. there there is disdain for that kind of slave trader, right? But the disdain there really reflects, I think, a broader disdain for uh, itinerants in general, right? People who came and went, you didn't know where they came from. White Southerners are very suspicious of itinerants sort of as a, as a class of person. I think that there's skepticism and suspicion of why are you here? Why are you trying to sell me these people? You're probably not really that trustworthy. I might do business with you in a pinch, but I really don't want to ever see you again. But the truth is that the more established a slave trader was, the more successful a slave trader was, the more that you knew, all right, this guy has an office building where I know I can track him down. This guy has relationships with merchants and bankers and politicians who I know personally and can trust. The more successful and established a slave trader was, the less that reputation attached to them. You know, well-established and successful slave traders were well-established and successful members of the societies that they lived in. So I, I think the the idea that slave traders sort of as a class or as a kind of business were universally disdained, it simply doesn't hold water. Uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't add up to what the, it doesn't match what the realities were. Well, I kind of always use as a shorthand for a slave trader, someone like Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, who you know, made a lot of money. And if you did say something bad about him, he'd probably just kill you for it. So it was kind of like this very, like kind of a frontier mentality in a lot of ways with these guys, even though yeah, there is that, but like, look, I I don't know a huge amount of, uh, of what sort of Forrest's reputation was as a slave trader. Yeah. but But I bet you, if you take a look at, at, at Forrest's sort of social status in and around Memphis, it's not – he's not the sort of the dregs and the social outcasts that you would imagine that he would be, right? Yeah, I um, think you're right, yeah. It, it, men like that didn't go on and become generals in the Confederate Army, right? You didn't take some low-life slave trader and turn him into a general. That's not how – that's not how it worked. <laughs> um, yeah, and, no, and, you're and maybe, right. Maybe, yeah. I'm, maybe I'm wrong. You know, I'm not a scholar of Forrest in particular, but 
I'd be very surprised if that was true. I, I, I actually he's the exception. That, he's the I, exception. I actually, I actually suspect that Forrest was the kind of guy who, you know, people in and around Memphis knew that he was a, you know, he was a big slave trader and, and he was the kind of guy you could do business with. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, all this stuff is legal. I mean, even to yeah. use the drug dealer analogy, I mean, they're doing something illegal, but these guys, I mean, maybe better analogy is used car salesmen. I mean, I don't know, like sort of they're they're making money. People are maybe a little skeptical, but still, you know, they're they're part of the engine of the of the economy in the south so yeah i mean I, look i wouldn't push the i wouldn't push the it, it, anytime we get into these analogies right you you, you get <laughs> right. it no well no i mean it, it ends up it's inevitably crass right because yeah. it, and, and i don't mean that's criticize you like sure it, it, it's just that it's the nature of, of the way you talk about this is that when you're talking about a business that deals with enslaved people as merchandise and you want to find an analogy to that you always end up with some other kind of merchandise that's all of a sudden not human and yeah. then all of a sudden, the, the the sheer sort of ugliness of all of it gets thrown into relief, right? But you know, if you want to sort of look at it like like used cars, for example, let's just say for the sake of argument, you know, look the the when you and I were growing up, right? The 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 cliche of sort of the shady businessman was the used car dealer, and sometimes you still see that. But there's also now an entire industry of what is now what do they call it? it's like pre-owned vehicles. Right. And <laughs> yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. I right. bought a car that way. Right. Me I too. went online. Yeah. yeah, sure. I went online. I looked at, you know, the, the, the car manufacturer, the, the brand of car that I bought. It runs totally through their website. You know, you can count on them because it runs through the dealership. It's a perfectly normal way to buy a car. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's very different from you know, an, what, what used to be thought of as like the used car lot where like who knows where those cars come from? Who knows what the dealer's been doing to them? And it, they're really, you know, there, there is something to that analogy where, you know, a business that, that seems shady in some ways, there's nothing wrong with that business. It's perfectly respectable business. And the people who do it are perfectly respectable businessmen. Well, and I think probably you could focus on any industries to a certain degree and find exactly. these, these shady operators. But exactly. And, and, you know, I guess to get back to the kind of this issue of capitalism, like in a way, I don't know how you sort of framed it, maybe as you're writing it and probably going back to your other work too, like, is this sort of a, is this a uniquely American story to you? Or are you kind of telling that dark side of the American dream to, to you know what I mean? Like, is this sort of a story of, guys on the make and doing whatever, you know, kind of new money yeah, kind of I dudes. Mean, yeah. I mean, the, the, look, the version of the story that I tell is I, I wouldn't say a uniquely American story, but, but the, the story that I'm interested in is a, a story that grows particularly out of American culture. It grows out of a particular moment of American economic development um, it grows out of an institution of slavery that operates in the United States in particular ways. I don't think that that some of the things that I talk about in the book are unique to the United States. I, I think we all know that that slavery and and trading in enslaved people is a is a, a, a transnational phenomenon. It's something that exists in many places and many times. It looks different in it, different places. That's simply, but that's sort of not my particular research agenda, right? I'm not interested in in pursuing that line of, of research and analysis. I don't mean I'm, a, I'm, I'm not interested, meaning I don't care. I find it very interesting. It's just not something that I personally do. Okay. Well, in a, in a, in a way, I mean, your research and your writing just kind of speaks for itself. I mean, you can certainly compare it to other experiences and sure. and through time. And, you know, I'm, I'm rewatching the show Better Call Saul. I don't know if you, yeah, you've watched I love that. that. Show. I, yeah. I love that show. And, and again, it's like this, this, this classic American character who is willing to do some pretty shady stuff yeah. to yeah. turn a buck. And um, so, you know, now, nowadays I kind of read back into everything this way to a certain degree you kind of just see these patterns yeah it's not necessarily just in america but i think there there are certain twists on it that are there are you are uniquely ours uh, yeah for, i for think that's right i mean i think that these are things that are that are you know there's nothing about any of these things that are 
that are uniquely American in that you wouldn't see them anyplace else in the world. I think that's mostly untrue, but every culture has its own its own things and it's every nation has its own sort of particularities and peculiarities and and yeah i mean you know better call saul you know the the the, there are con men all over the world but there's something about the way the con man operates in american culture in particular that is specific to america yeah you got to be charming to a certain degree and uh got to be smart and a little bit ruthless but no i mean it's funny the other various places i've lived like when i was out in little rock for a few years like it kind of felt like the wild west like the the west is still sort of alive and well in america and that that mindset i think to a certain degree that's interesting i i yeah i mean i i could imagine that i i have not spent i i've been out west many times but i have not sort of i've never really lived out west so i don't but know. have you felt that a little bit like even in in tuscaloosa like compared to the northeast like this is just a, a different world that ever you know, um, feel that way. Yes. But I, I but I think, you know, I, I think that manifests itself in, in lots of different ways. You know, we, we, we'd have to sort of get into particulars of that. And look, okay. I think it's easy to sort of overgeneralize about the way different cultures and different regions of the country operate. Sure. But, um, but yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's things about the way Alabama works that aren't the way about, aren't isn't the way new york works and and vice versa for sure well and just geographically i mean growing up in a place where you couldn't you know there wasn't this flatness to it the way <laughs> like parts of arkansas had and uh other, other parts of the country i've, I've been into since then um, you mean literal flatness literal yeah literally yeah. i mean just yeah. like parts of arkansas don't seem like you're in texas it's just right nothing, right just right right no la- landscape wise it, it is uh uh yeah, I mean, there's definitely sort of di- very different vibes that you get from 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 different landscapes. I would but you're kind of that. more like the 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 gr- the green part of Alabama. I mean, you're not like you know a desert like the way some part. Of yeah, live. no, I mean, Al- Alabama's a pretty green place by right, and large. Right. You know, it's, it's a there's a lot of forest. Um, you know, Lower Alabama has sort of a wiregrass kind of part to it, but. You know, northern Alabama is basically the lower Appalachians. It's the mountains. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, Alabama is actually a pretty – it's a pretty lovely state, uh, you know, just in terms of its its topography, its landscape, its its um, the flora and fauna. It's, it's, it's a very pretty state in a lot of ways. Well, you've been there a while, so it sounds like you've gone native to, well, a, to a large degree. I, I mean, look, I, there, there's – like I said, I, I think the, the – there are a lot of things I really love about, about – Alabama and there's a lot of things that I perfectly acknowledge that Alabama has some pretty you know some pretty significant problems to it I mean that's not that's nothing uh, uh, that's nothing earth shattering to make that kind of observation yeah well that's a healthy way to think about it well if you have a couple minutes um, it looks like you you've already started a new project do you want to talk about that a little bit your new book uh, project which which project I haven't started a, a new book but Elijah T- Tyson is that oh you... that book um <laughs> yeah, so so that that is not sort of a full on book. I don't think okay. it's going to be so. So that's a project where um, you know, in the course of doing the research on the slave trade and slave traders, I, I came across this narrative. It's really it, it's a biography that was written at, about this man named Elisha Tyson. And after his death, one of his relatives wrote a, a, a story of his life. And Tyson was a guy who was one of these really kind of early anti-slavery activists. He was in Baltimore. He'd gotten very, very rich in the, in the milling business. Um, he's a Quaker. And uh, he's one of these sort of guys who's in this kind of transitional period you know you have the sort of very early anti-slavery activists of the revolutionary period and then you get the radical abolitionists of sort of the 1830s and moving forward he's sort of a guy who's kind of in the middle there sort of 1810s maybe into the 1820s and what what i found fascinating about him is not only that that it, he speaks to a moment where there's this sort of in-betweenness in the in the abolition movement, but 
what attracted me to him is some of the stories about the things that he did. He would, you know, he used some of the, a lot of the money that he earned to um, help enslaved people file freedom lawsuits. He would go to uh, places where slave traders were keeping enslaved people, some of whom they'd actually kidnapped, right? They're free black people who they'd kidnapped. And he'd go and he'd bust them out. Um, <laughs> you know, wow. and slave traders, slave traders would show up at his house and be like, Dude, what are you doing? You just stole these people who I've bought. And he would be like, well, if you want to try to get past me and get in my house and bust them out, you can go for it. But I don't think that's going to go so well for you. Wow. And I would read these stories and be like, this kind of blew my mind. Like I'd never, I'd never heard of this guy before. I'd never sort of come across somebody who, who, who would do things like this. And so – yeah, so that project is basically taking that 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 biography and um, sort of re-releasing it. It really isn't in print anymore. Okay. Um, you know, sort of writing an introduction, annotating the text, um, and publishing that. So that that's sort of an offshoot of this project. It was something I wanted to work with, but I, it didn't really fit in the book. And so, so yeah, so I'm working on that now. In terms of a next book project, I, I'm still thinking about that. I haven't quite settled on something yet. I, I, I think I have a general idea of what I want to work on, but, but what exactly it's going to look like in practice, I still have not quite sorted out. Okay. So Tyson, kind of a badass Quaker. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, and not, not, not the kind of character you sort of come across a lot. But I actually suspect that there are more people like him than we, than we remember and than we imagine. The anti-slavery movement, it, it definitely changes over time. But I think that there's more of a continuity to it than we usually – than the way we sort of frame it usually reflects. Well, and it puts the lie to this idea you hear from some people that like – you can't judge the past by present day standards and as if like everybody was on board with slavery and never wanted to. Yeah. I mean, it. look, I look, the, the truth is that, that in American society in the 19th century, and this was true really even up until the civil war, look, right. most white people were not abolitionists. They just weren't right. They're, they're not sort of, you know, there's certainly plenty of people who particularly as time goes on have sort of mixed feelings about slavery. They don't, they don't really want to see slavery keep growing. They don't really like slaveholders. Um, but but being like anti-slavery, that that's a, a distinctly minority position uh, among white people in American society. However, yes, there are always people who know that slavery was wrong. There are always people who believe that slavery ought to be abolished. Certainly enslaved people themselves always believed that slavery was wrong. So yeah. I mean that argument that like you know we have to judge them by the standards of their time was like well there were people at their time who who made this case yeah, they just yeah. they just didn't agree with it right so so yeah yeah I mean I I think there are a lot of things that put the lie to that sort of argument and there have always been anti vaxxers going back to you know the Puritans there's, you know look there there's you know the idea that that's that that look you I, I'd say this with regard to slavery you've got to go back a long way in human history. To get to a point where, um, you know, there really wasn't a way to conceptualize being opposed to slavery in practice. There, there is a time when that's true, right? I think particularly sort of pre-enlightenment, right? The idea that sort of slavery is just sort of a natural part of what makes humanity work, that's pretty universal, right? But really, I mean, the last, you know, 300 years at least – there have always been people who, who made the case that, that, like, look, universal human freedom is a value. You know, slavery as an institution is not right. There have always been people like that for, for going back at least several centuries. Yeah, for sure. And so, uh, okay, so you said you might have another book project. You're not sure what what you're going to do exactly. Yeah, I mean, what I'm, so I'll tell you what I'm toying with, and, and, and it'll sure. become clear right away why I haven't really settled on anything. So I, I'm, I'm getting I, – I'd like to move at least a little bit away from slavery. I mean this book was, is really, really heavy. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was hard to sort of live with for a long time, and I'd like something that is not quite as intense. Um, I don't think I'm ever going to move away entirely from – Slavery, emancipation, issues of race. I mean, that's just sort of what I do and it's what I'm interested in. Um, but I need something that's not the slave trade. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I'm interested, though, in this moment in, in American, uh, American political development, American society, American culture. Uh, this moment kind of in the, the sort of early to mid-1870s as a time when sort of reconstruction is still going on, but it's clearly struggling. It's clearly sort of you know holding on for dear life. Um, but it's also simultaneously a moment when the Gilded Age is born, right? These there's a sort of weird inflection point I think that happens in the in in 1872, 73, 74, where the nation is sort of trying to come to terms with emancipation and figure out how to how to reunify itself as a nation. But is also sort of turning toward uh, a, a different kind of future, where in some ways they actually abandon that 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 project of trying to uh, uh, really make emancipation work. And we know this story, right? We we know that that that's sort of what happens with Reconstruction. But I, I, I'm interested in in the moment where where that turning starts to happen. You know, 1873, for example, is the year when, when Mark Twain writes The Gilded Age, right? That's the year The Gilded Age is published. Okay. Um, it's also the year when, uh, you know, the slaughterhouse cases are passed and the Supreme are, are ratified in the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court basically says, you know, all the civil rights legislation, yeah, that's not really going to, that's not really going to play out. <laughs> um, you know, you can't, you can't sort of apply that. At, at the state level, you know, the it's the same year when, um, you know, the Colfax massacre happens in in the South, and it's also the year that the Panic of eighteen seventy three happens. So there, 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 there's a, there's something in there. I can't put my finger on what it is or what the hook is yet, but there's something about that turning point, the turning away from Reconstruction and toward the Gilded Age, that that's a moment that I'm interested in. Okay, oh, that sounds interesting. And is the new book, uh, is that technically out right now? I think I got like an advanced copy. But oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it came out uh, came out on April 20th. Okay, okay. So it's been out for a little over a week. And are you, you tracking the, the sales on Amazon or anything like that? I am you... not tracking sales. I do look at the Amazon <laughs> ranking because yeah. I, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to pretend that I don't care. It's addictive, uh, yeah. Actually, I, I wouldn't say I care that much, but I am very – I'm interested in it. I'd like to see it do well, obviously. Yeah. But I don't know what the sales are like. That That's something I leave up to the press, and I, I, I hope it sells well. Um, I hope a lot of people read it. Uh, you know, I, I – I, 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 I hope it does well in part because, look, it, it's, you know, I put in a lot of work and every author wants to see their book do well and, and it's gratifying for an ego. But I do like to think that the book talks about a subject matter that even though it's really, really difficult to spend a lot of time with, I think it's important that more people have an understanding of the subject, are willing to kind of grapple with the subject and are willing to think about what the broader implications of it are for where the United States is now. And and we'll see if that happens. Yeah, well, I, I think you've done a great job with it. And um, yeah, I look forward to finishing it. And it does kind of take me inside that world in a way that I don't think any other book has. You know, you, def you definitely did your homework. and <laughs> I did. I did. That is true. I don't know. Has COVID, were you going to do some talks and stuff? Has COVID put that off or were you... Uh, not so much. Yeah, it sort of put that off. I mean, yeah. I, it, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm obviously I'm doing some events and I'm starting to schedule some in-person events for the fall for the, for the spring that none of them are in person. But, you know, what's interesting about the way this has played out, though, like I, I, I wish they were in person. But one of the things about them not being in person and having to do it on Zoom is that, you know, you're not going to. Well, I'm not at least going to get up there and give sort of, you know, a 45 minute talk on Zoom. Nobody really wants to listen to that. It goes on for too long. So when I give something that's like a book talk, I try to keep it to maybe 30, 35 minutes, yeah. which I actually like a lot better. And I like the time for questions. But really, a lot of these events are these kind of conversation style, right, where someone has read the book and they, you know, I give maybe a five minute spiel of what the book is about. And then really it's them asking me questions about the book, and we have kind of a, dis a conversation about it, and then we open that up to the audience. And I actually think those are great. I think that's a great format for book events, and, and I don't know if that will 
that will outlast outlast COVID. But um, but I actually think that that you know it may be one of these things. We know that some things about about the COVID era are gonna people will will have gotten experience with them and say, you know what, I actually kind of like that. I'm gonna keep doing that. Yeah. Um, and and th- this may be one of those things. You know where you know instead of going to a, a, a university and just giving a book talk, you know I. I'd go to a university and, and there'd be a, a faculty member who'd read the book and we sit up on the stage and, you know, have a conversation about it for half an hour and then open it to the audience. And I, I find those much more rewarding. Each one is a little bit different because everybody brings different things to a book. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely changed the way book publicity has happened, but I, 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 it, it's hard for me to tell whether it's, it's, it's limited it or not. I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Yeah. Well, I guess time will tell. Um, yeah. But no, I agree. I like that format. I, I saw Tony Horowitz do a talk um, a year or two before he died and he had just written his John Brown book and uh-huh. he got up there. He didn't talk per se. Like he just took questions. It was just a Q and a for like an hour. I was like, interesting. That's interesting. confidence when you just. <laughs> yeah, I saw Tony. I saw Tony give a talk once when I was in graduate school, and I can't remember if that was the style that he did it in. I don't. Know. Yeah, I don't know. He, I don't know. Maybe he was just like, I'm just gonna wing it tonight. And maybe, um, maybe these people know God, who I, I am. That guy. Was, yeah, I know. I know. I, I miss mean, that guy. I mean, I, I only met him a couple times, and you know, so I wouldn't say I miss him like personally as a friend, but. Man, I loved his. I love his writing. Yeah, he was he was really great. Yeah, uh, Confederates in the Attic is just such a it's such. Oh a great yeah, book. I mean Confederates in the Attic is a great book, but um, I, I've I've loved everything I've ever read by him. I've read you know I haven't read every. I don't think I've actually read every single book, but I've read I've read most of them. Yeah, um, I need to read the 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 one on John Brown because I'm kind of, I mean the one on John Brown is good. Yeah, uh, the one I read most recently actually was an old one that I had not the one i need to read is spying on the south right that was the last one which i still okay, have and I haven't okay. gotten around to reading but i went back after he passed away and i read um i read blue latitudes you know the one where he follows captain cook uh okay. he goes like to the south pacific and and like you know follows captain cook's journeys through the south pacific it's so good uh uh you know that's the kind of stuff that that like i did, i had not read of his before and it was just yeah it makes you realize that the the kind of talent that 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 we lost with him is really it's really tragic. Yeah, for sure. Well, and it's sort of this you as a historian and you go through the academic channels and then these journalists just kind of keep putting out these books where <laughs> they make it accessible to everyone and it's very memorable, yeah, you know, yeah, it's like... uh, you know, and and acad- academic historians always bitch about those people and sometimes <laughs> with reason, but you know, some do it better than others. Right. You know, I I I really Yeah. I don't begrudge a journalist, you know, taking on a, a, a historical subject and, and doing it well. I mean, I, you know, it, and there's nothing wrong with a history book. that's just a good read. Right. I mean, that's even though my book's about the slave trade. I mean, you could tell from the way I wrote it. Like, I just I just want it to be something people can read. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it is that. So, well, um, good luck with the book and Thanks. congratulations. And Josh, it was, it was great talking to you. We're glad we could do this. Yeah, and, you too. All right, that was my talk with Josh Rothman. Check out his new book, The Ledger and the Chain, How Domestic Slave Traders Shaped America. I think that would be a, a great book to assign to students, uh, certainly grad students, but uh, also I think undergrads would enjoy the the real humanist approach he takes with this, uh, even if there's some unsavory characters in the book. Uh, he, he looks at them in a, in a way that is very detailed and gives you a great understanding of what's going on in the minds of these people in the 19th century and, and how they're able to do what they do. So uh, well-written book and very deeply researched, so you should enjoy that. You can help me out by checking out my book, by buying my book, in fact, Marching Masters, Slavery, Race, and the Confederate Army During the Civil War, available through University of Virginia Press. I've not been selling much lately, but hopefully that can change if, if uh, you are interested in the Civil War. Something for your students, graduate or undergraduate, and uh, if you sign the book, uh, who knows, maybe I could give a talk in your class via Zoom or something like that. If you're in the Richmond area, I might even come in person and take the students off your hands for an hour or so. All right, well, the the hot weather is coming in the next day or so. 
and we've been thinking about getting a pool so I think we need to pull the trigger on that is uh, 90 degrees for multiple days in May is a little unusual here in Richmond but you know given the the, the high temperatures we see again and again these days uh, you, you got to be ready for the summer usually by June it's it's pretty hot down here uh, but having a pool will be nice to take the edge off of things and now that we have bought our house we can do whatever we want in the backyard and we certainly have although not much has been happening with our porch yet uh, hopefully that'll be done by the fall because uh, you can enjoy the outdoors well into November here in Richmond but I, I've been wanting a pool pretty much my whole life so uh, despite COVID and all the problems in the last year or so we're, we're trying to get back to normal and actually uh, enjoy some of the, the luxuries of life. All right well I hope you're doing okay. I will be talking with you soon with a new guest. Take care. Bye.